Apollo 17 was the final moon landing mission of NASA's Apollo program, the most recent time humans have set foot on the moon or gone beyond low Earth orbit. The third mission to carry the lunar roving vehicle, its crew consisted of Commander Eugene Cernan, Lunar Module Pilot Harrison Schmidt, and Command Module Pilot Ronald Evans. Schmidt was the only scientist to set foot on the moon, and the mission had a heavy emphasis on science, with a number of new experiments, including a biological experiment containing five mice carried in the command module. Launched at 12.33 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on December 7, 1972, Apollo 17 was a J-type mission that included three days on the lunar surface, extended scientific capability, and the use of the third lunar roving vehicle. Cernan and Schmidt landed in the Taurus Litro Valley and completed three moonwalks, taking lunar samples and deploying scientific instruments. The landing site had been chosen to further the mission's main goals, to sample lunar highland material older than Mare Imbrium, and to investigate the possibility of relatively recent volcanic activity. Evans remained in lunar orbit in the command and service module, taking scientific measurements and photographs. Cernan, Evans, Schmidt, and the mice returned to Earth on December 19. Apollo 17 was the first mission to have no one on board who had been a test pilot. X-15 test pilot Joe Engel lost the lunar module pilot assignment to Schmidt, a geologist. The mission included the first night launch of a U.S. crewed spacecraft and the final crewed launch of a Saturn V rocket. It was also the final use of Apollo hardware for its original purpose. The mission broke several crewed spaceflight records, including the longest moon landing, greatest distance from a spacecraft during an EVA. Of any type, longest total lunar surface extravehicular activities. Largest lunar sample return, longest time in lunar orbit and most lunar orbits. In 1969, NASA announced that the backup crew of Apollo 14 would be Eugene Cernan, Ronald Evans, and former X-15 pilot Joe Engel. This put them in line to be prime crew of Apollo 17, as the Apollo program's crew rotation generally meant that a backup crew would fly as prime crew three missions later. Meanwhile, Harrison Schmidt, a professional geologist before becoming an astronaut, served on the backup crew of Apollo 15, and would be due to fly as lunar module pilot on Apollo 18 as a result of the rotation. However, Apollo 18 was cancelled in September 1970. The scientific community pressed NASA to find a way to assign a geologist, rather than a pilot with non-professional geological training, to an Apollo landing. NASA subsequently assigned Schmidt to Apollo 17 as the lunar module pilot. Schmidt's selection to the Apollo 17 crew left NASA Director of Flight Crew Operations Deke Sladen with the question of who would fill the two. Other Apollo 17 slots, the rest of the Apollo 15 backup crew or the Apollo 14 backup crew. Sladen ultimately chose Cernan and Evans. Cernan, a 38-year-old captain in the United States Navy at the time of Apollo 17, had been selected in the third group of astronauts in 1963. He flew as pilot of Gemini 9A in 1966 and as lunar module pilot of Apollo 10 in 1969 before his service on Apollo 14's backup crew. Evans, selected as part of the fifth group of astronauts in 1966, was 39 years old at the time of Apollo 17 and a lieutenant commander in the United States Navy. Schmidt, a civilian, was 37 years old at the time of Apollo 17. With a doctorate in geology from Harvard University, he had been selected in the fourth group of astronauts in 1965. For Apollo 16 and 17, the final Apollo lunar missions, NASA selected backup crews consisting of astronauts who had already flown Apollo lunar missions, thus taking advantage of their experience. The alternative was to train astronauts as backup crew members who most likely would not have an opportunity to put their lunar mission training to use in flight. By using lunar veterans, NASA saved the time, money and effort which would be involved in training rookies for these dead-end positions. The original backup crew for Apollo 17 was the crew of Apollo 15, David Scott as commander, Alfred Worden as CMP and James Irwin as LMP, however, in June 1972, they were removed because of their roles in the Apollo 15 postal covers incident. They were replaced with the landing crew of Apollo 16, John W. Young as backup crew commander and Charles Duke as LMP, and Apollo 14 CMP, Stuart Rusa. Originally, Apollo 16 CMP, Ken Mattingly was to be assigned along with his crewmates, but he declined so he could spend more time with his family, his first son having just been born, and instead took an assignment to the space shuttle program. 
For Apollo, a third crew of astronauts, known as the support crew, was designated in addition to the prime and backup crews used on projects Mercury and Gemini. Slayton created the support crews because James McDivitt, who would command Apollo 9, believed that, with preparation going on in facilities across the U.S., meetings that needed a member of the flight crew would be missed. Support crew members were to assist as directed by the mission commander. Usually low in seniority, they assembled the mission's rules, flight plan, and checklists, and kept them updated. For Apollo 17, there were Robert F. Overmere, Robert A. Parker and C. Gordon Fullerton. Flight directors were Jerry Griffin, first shift, Gene Kronz and Neil B. Hutchinson, second shift, and Pete Frank and Charles R. Lewis, third shift. Flight directors during Apollo had a one-sentence job description. The flight director may take any actions necessary for crew safety and mission success. Capsule communicators were Fullerton, Parker, Young, Duke, Mattingly, Rusa, Alan Shepard and Joseph P. Allen. Apollo 17 Space Flown Silver Robins Medallion The insignia's most prominent feature is an image of the Greek sun god Apollo backdropped by a rendering of an American eagle, the red bars on the eagle mirroring those on the flag of the United States. Three white stars above the red bars represent the three crewmen of the mission. The background includes the moon, the planet Saturn, and a galaxy or nebula. The wing of the eagle partially overlays the moon, suggesting humanity's established presence there. The insignia includes, along with the colors of the U.S. flag, the color gold, representative of a golden age of spaceflight that was to begin with Apollo 17. The image of Apollo in the mission insignia is a rendering of the Apollo Belvedere sculpture in the Vatican Museums. It looks forward into the future, towards the celestial objects shown in the insignia beyond the moon. These are humanity's goals, and the image symbolizes human intelligence, wisdom and ambition. The insignia was designed by Robert McCall, based on ideas from the crew. In deciding the call signs for the CM and LM, the crew wished to pay tribute to the American public, and to the mission, and wanted names with a tradition within American history. The CM was given the call sign America. According to Cernan, this evoked the 19th century sailing ships which were given that name, and was a thank you to the people of the United States. The crew selected the name Challenger for the LM, selecting it over heritage. Cernan stated that the selected name just seemed to describe more of what the future for America really held, and that was a challenge. After Schmidt stepped onto the moon from Challenger, he stated, I think the next generation ought to accept this as a challenge. Let's see them leave footprints like these. Landing site, as imaged from the Apollo 17 command module. 1972 Like Apollo 15 and Apollo 16, Apollo 17 was slated to be a J mission, an Apollo mission type that featured lunar surface stays of three days, higher scientific capability, and the usage of the lunar roving vehicle. Since Apollo 17 was to be the final lunar landing of the Apollo program, high-priority landing sites that had not been visited previously were given consideration for potential exploration. Some sites were rejected at earlier stages. Thus, a landing in the crater Copernicus was rejected because Apollo 12 had already obtained samples from that impact, and three other Apollo expeditions had already visited the vicinity of Mare Imbrium. A landing in the lunar highlands near the crater Tycho was rejected because of the rough terrain found there. A landing on the lunar far side in the crater Tsiolkovsky was rejected due to technical considerations and the operational costs of maintaining communication during surface operations. A landing in a region southwest of Mare Crisium was rejected on the grounds that a Soviet spacecraft could easily access the site. Luna 20 in fact did so shortly after the Apollo 17 site selection was made. Schmidt advocated for a landing on the far side of the moon until told by Director of Flight Operations Christopher C. Kraft that it would not happen as NASA lacked the funds for the necessary communication satellites. After the elimination of the above sites, three sites made the final consideration for Apollo 17, Alphonsus Crater, Gassendi Crater, and the Taurus Litro Valley. In making the final landing site decision, mission planners took into consideration the primary objectives for Apollo 17, obtaining old highlands. Material from a substantial distance from Mare Imbrium, sampling material from young volcanic activity. And having minimal ground overlap with the orbital ground tracks of Apollo 15 and Apollo 16 to maximize the amount of new data obtained. A significant reason for the selection of Taurus Litro was that Apollo 15 CMP, Worden, had overflown the site and observed features he described as likely volcanic in nature. 
Gassendi was eliminated because NASA felt that its central peak would be difficult to reach due to the roughness of the local terrain, and, though Alphonsus might be easier operationally than Taurus Litro, it had less scientific interest. At Taurus Litro, it was believed that the crew would be able to obtain samples of old highland material from the remnants of a landslide event that occurred on the south wall of the valley and the possibility of relatively young. Explosive volcanic activity in the area. Although the valley is similar to the landing site of Apollo 15 in that it is on the border of a lunar mare, the advantages of Taurus Litro were believed to outweigh the drawbacks. On the unanimous recommendation of the Apollo Site Selection Board at its final meeting in February 1972, NASA selected Taurus Litro as the landing site for Apollo 17. Jean Cernan participates in geology training in Sudbury, Ontario, in May 1972 as with previous lunar landings, the Apollo 17 astronauts underwent an extensive training program that included learning to collect samples on the surface. Usage of the spacesuits, navigation in the lunar roving vehicle, field geology training, survival training, splashdown and recovery training, and equipment training. The geology field trips were conducted as much as possible like the astronauts were on the moon, they would be provided with overhead images and maps, and briefed on features of the site and the suggested routing. The following day, they would follow the route, and have tasks and observations to be done at each of the stops. The geology field trips began with one to Big Bend National Park in Texas in October 1971. The early ones were not specifically tailored to prepare the astronauts for Taurus Litro, which was not selected until February 1972. But by June, the astronauts were going on field trips to sites specifically selected to prepare for Apollo 17's landing site. Both Cernan and Schmidt had served on backup crews for Apollo landing missions, and were familiar with many of the procedures. Their trainers, such as Gordon Swan, feared that Cernan would defer to Schmidt as a professional geologist on matters within his field. Cernan also had to adjust for the loss of Engel, with whom he had trained for Apollo 14. In spite of these issues, Cernan and Schmidt worked well together as a team, and Cernan became adept at describing what he was seeing on geology field trips, and working independently of Schmidt when necessary. The landing crew aimed for a division of labor so that, when they arrived in a new area, Cernan would perform tasks such as adjusting the antenna on the lunar roving vehicle so as to transmit to Earth while Schmidt gave a report on the geological aspects of the site. This would allow the scientists in the geology backroom to adjust the task's plan for that site, which would be transmitted to the Capcom and then to Cernan and Schmidt. According to William R. Muehlberger, one of the scientists who trained the astronauts, in effect he, Schmidt, was running the mission from the moon. But we set it up this way. All of those within the geological world certainly knew it. And I had a sneaking hunch that the top brass knew it too, but this is a practical way out, and they didn't object. Also participating in some of the geology field trips were the commander and lunar module pilot of the backup crew. The initial field trips took place before the Apollo 15 astronauts were assigned as the backup crew for Apollo 17 in February 1972. Either one or both of David Scott and James Irwin of Apollo 15 took part in four field trips, though both were there only for two of them. After they were removed from the backup crew, the new backup commander and LMP, Young and Duke, took part in the final four field trips. On field trips, the backup crew would follow half an hour after the prime crew, performing identical tasks, and have their own simulated CAPCOM and mission control guiding them. The Apollo 17 astronauts had 14 field trips, the Apollo 11 crew had had one. Evans did not go on the geology field trips, having his own set of trainers, by this time, geology training for the CMP was well established. He would fly with a NASA geologist-slash-pilot, Dick Laidley, over geologic features, with part of the exercise conducted at 40,000 feet, and part at 1,000 feet to 5,000 feet. The higher altitude was equivalent to what could be seen from the planned lunar orbit of about 60 nautical miles with binoculars. Evans would be briefed for several hours before each exercise, and given steady guides. Afterwards, there would be debriefing and evaluation. Evans was trained regarding lunar geology by Farouk el Baz late in the training cycle, this continued until close to launch. The CMP was given information regarding the lunar features he would overfly in the CSM and which he was expected to photograph. Following the cancellation of Apollo 20 in early 1970, NASA decided there would be no more than two Apollo missions per year. Part of the reason Apollo 17 was scheduled for December 1972 was to make it fall after the presidential election, ensuring that if there was a disaster, 
it would have no effect on President Nixon's re-election campaign. The first piece of the launch vehicle to arrive at Kennedy Space Center was the S-2 second stage, on October 27, 1970, it was followed by the SIVB on December 21, the SIC first stage did not arrive until May 11, 1972, followed by the instrument unit on June 7. By then, LM-12 had arrived, the ascent stage on June 16, 1971 and the descent stage the following day, they were not mated until May 18, 1972. CM-114, SM-114 and SLA-21 all arrived on March 24, 1972. The rover reached Kaisse on June 2, 1972. CERN and Schmidt in the LRV with the LM in the background, August 1972 the CM and SM were mated on March 28, 1972, and the testing of the spacecraft began that month. The CSM was placed in a vacuum chamber at Kaisse, and the testing was conducted under those conditions. The LM was also placed in a vacuum chamber, both the Prime and the backup crews participated in testing the CSM and LM. During the testing, it was discovered that the LM's rendezvous radar assembly had received too much voltage during earlier tests, it was replaced by the manufacturer. Grumman. The LM's landing radar also gave trouble, locking up intermittently, and was also replaced. The LRV's front and rear steering motors also had to be replaced, and it required several modifications. Following the July 1972 removal from the vacuum chamber, the LM's landing gear was installed, and it, the CSM and the SLA were mated to each other. The combined craft was moved into the vehicle assembly building in August for further testing, after which it was mounted on the launch vehicle. After completing testing, including a simulated mission, the LRV was placed in the LM on August 13. Erection of the stages of the launch vehicle began on May 15, 1972 in High Bay 3 of the VOB, and was completed on June 27. Since the launch vehicles for Skylab 1 and Skylab 2 were being processed in the VOB at the same time, this marked the first time NASA had three launch vehicles there since the height of the Apollo program in 1969. After the spacecraft was mounted on the launch vehicle on August 24, it was rolled out to Pad 39A on August 28. Although this was not the final time a Saturn V would fly, area residents reacted as though it was. And 5,000 of them watched the rollout, during which the prime crew joined the operating crew from Bendix atop the crawler. At Pad 39A, testing continued, and the CSM was electrically mated to the launch vehicle on October 11, 1972. Testing concluded with the countdown demonstration tests, accomplished on November 20th and 21st. The countdown to launch began at 7.53 a.m. on December 5, 1972. The Apollo 17 spacecraft consisted of Command Module 114 and Service Module 114, together forming CSM-114, and Lunar Module 12. Together with a spacecraft Lunar Module adapter, numbered SLA-21, and a launch escape system. The LA contained a rocket motor that would propel the CM to safety in the event of an aborted mission in the moments after launch, while the SLA housed the LM during the launch and early part of the flight. The LA was jettisoned after the launch vehicle ascended to the point that it was not needed, while the SLA was left atop the SIVB third stage of the rocket after the CSM and LM separated from it. Apollo 17 lunar roving vehicle as it was finally left parked on the moon. The surface electrical properties receiver is the antenna on the right rear of the vehicle Apollo 17 was the third mission to make use of a lunar roving vehicle. The LRV, in addition to being used by the astronauts for transport from station to station on the mission's three moonwalks, was used to transport the astronauts' tools, communications equipment, and samples. The Apollo 17 LRV was also used to carry experiments unique to the mission, such as the Traverse Gravimeter and Surface Electrical Properties Experiment. The Apollo 17 LRV traveled a cumulative distance of approximately 35. 9 kilometers in a total drive time of about 4 hours and 26 minutes, the greatest distance Eugene Cernan and Harrison Schmidt traveled from the lunar module was about 7. 6 kilometers. The Apollo Lunar Surface Experiments Package was a suite of nuclear-powered experiments, flown on each landing mission after Apollo 11. This equipment was to be emplaced by the astronauts, and continue to function after the astronauts return to Earth. For Apollo 17, the ULSEP experiments were a heat flow experiment, to measure the of heat loss from the interior of the Moon, a lunar surface gravimeter. To measure precisely the lunar gravity field at the site, a lunar atmospheric composition experiment, 
to measure the composition of the thin lunar atmosphere. A lunar seismic profiling experiment, to study the nature and physical properties of the nearby surface and subsurface areas, and a lunar ejecta and meteorites experiment, to measure the velocity and energy of dust particles. Of these, only the HFE had been flown before, the others were new. The HFE had been flown on the aborted Apollo 13, as well as Apollo 15 and 16, but only placed successfully on Apollo 15, and unexpected results from that device made scientists anxious for a second successful emplacement. It was successfully deployed on Apollo 17. The LSG, based on one widely used on Earth, was intended to detect gravity waves, something that would confirm Einstein's general theory of relativity, it ultimately failed to function as intended. The LACE was a surface-deployed module that used a mass spectrometer to analyze the Moon's atmosphere. To ensure it was unaffected by the LM's liftoff, it was heated to drive off contamination during the lunar night that followed, and only then was activated. The LSPE was a seismic detecting device different from the seismometers emplaced on every landing from Apollo 12 to 16, as it used geophones, which would detect explosives to be set off by ground command once the astronauts left the moon. As well as the impact of the jettisoned LM ascent stage, after which it would be deactivated. It detected the liftoff of the ascent stage, as well as the explosives packages and the ascent stage's impact. The LEMI had a set of detectors to measure the characteristics of the dust particles it sought, to protect it from the material which would be stirred up by the LM's liftoff. It had a cover that would be jettisoned by ground command after the astronauts left. All powered all SEP experiments that remained active were deactivated on September 30, 1977, principally because of budgetary constraints. Traverse Gravimeter Apollo 17 was the mission to carry the Traverse Gravimeter experiment, built by Draper Laboratory at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. As gravimeters had proven to be useful in the geologic investigation of the Earth, the objective of this experiment was to determine the feasibility of using the same techniques on the Moon to learn about its internal structure. The gravimeter was used to obtain relative gravity measurements at the landing site in the immediate vicinity of the lunar module, as well as various locations on the mission's traverse routes. Scientists would then use this data to help determine the geological substructure of the landing site and the surrounding vicinity. The TGE was carried on the lunar roving vehicle, measurements were taken by the astronauts while the LRV was not in motion or after the gravimeter was placed on the surface. A total of 26 measurements were taken with the TGE during the mission's three moonwalks, with productive results. As part of the Apollo Lunar Surface Experiments Package, the astronauts also deployed the Lunar Surface Gravimeter, a similar experiment, which ultimately failed to function properly. Surface Electrical Properties Experiment Apollo 17 was the only lunar surface expedition to include the Surface Electrical Properties Experiment. The experiment included two major components, a transmitting antenna deployed near the lunar module and a receiving antenna located on the lunar roving vehicle. At different stops during the mission's traverses, electrical signals traveled from the transmitting device, through the ground, and were received. At the LRV, the electrical properties of the lunar soil could be determined by comparison of the transmitted and received electrical signals. The results of this experiment, which are consistent with lunar rock composition, show that the top 2 kilometers of the moon are extremely dry. Lunar neutron probe The lunar neutron probe was a 2. 4 meter long, 2 centimeters diameter probe to be inserted into one of the holes drilled into the surface to gain core samples. It measured the quantity of neutron flux found in the top 2 meters of the lunar surface. Placed during the first EVA, she was retrieved during the third and final EVA. It was returned to Earth, and the measurements from it were compared with the evidence of neutron flux in the core that had been removed from the hole it had been placed in. Biological Cosmic Ray Experiment Apollo 17 included a biological cosmic ray experiment, carrying five mice that had been implanted with radiation monitors to see whether they suffered damage from cosmic rays. The five pocket mice were implanted with radiation monitors under their scalps. They were placed in individual metal tubes inside a sealed container and flown on the mission. The species was chosen because it was well documented, small, easy to maintain in an isolated state, and for its ability to withstand environmental stress. Four of the five mice survived the flight, though only two of them appeared healthy and active, the cause of death of the fifth mouse was not determined. The study found lesions in the scalp itself and liver. The scalp lesions and liver lesions appeared to be unrelated to one another, and were not thought to be the result of cosmic rays. 
No damage was found in the mice's retinas or viscera. At the time of the publication of the Apollo 17 preliminary science report, the mouse brains had not yet been examined. However, subsequent studies showed no significant effect on the brains. Officially, the mice, four male and one female, were assigned the identification numbers A3326, A3400, A3305, A3356 and A3352. Unofficially, according to Cernan, the Apollo 17 crew dubbed them Fei, Phi, Fo, Fum, and Fui. Scientific Instrument Module Apollo 17 Simbay on the Service Module America, seen from the Lunar Module Challenger in orbit around the Moon Sector 1 of the Apollo 17 SM contained the Scientific Instrument Module Bay. The Simbay housed three experiments for use in lunar orbit, a lunar sounder, an infrared scanning radiometer, and a far ultraviolet spectrometer. A mapping camera, panoramic camera, and a laser altimeter were also included in the Simbay. The lunar sounder beamed electromagnetic impulses toward the lunar surface, which were designed with the objective of obtaining data to assist in developing a geological model of the interior of the Moon to an approximate depth of 1.3 kilometers. The infrared scanning radiometer was designed with the objective of generating a temperature map of the lunar surface to aid in locating surface features such as rock fields, structural differences in the lunar crust, and volcanic activity. The far ultraviolet spectrometer was to be used to obtain data pertaining to the composition, density, and constituency of the lunar atmosphere. The spectrometer was also designed to detect far UV radiation emitted by the sun that has been reflected off the lunar surface. The laser altimeter was designed with the intention of measuring the altitude of the spacecraft above the lunar surface within approximately 2 meters, and providing altitude information to the panoramic and mapping cameras. Light flash phenomenon throughout the Apollo lunar missions, the crew members observed light flashes that penetrated closed eyelids. These flashes, described as streaks or specks of light, were usually observed by astronauts while the spacecraft was darkened during a sleep period. These flashes, while not observed on the lunar surface, would average about two per minute and were observed by the crew members during the trip out to the moon, back to Earth, and in lunar orbit. The Apollo 17 crew conducted an experiment, also conducted on Apollo 16, with the objective of linking these light flashes with cosmic rays. As part of an experiment conducted by NASA and the University of Houston, one astronaut wore a device that recorded the time, strength, and path of high-energy atomic particles that penetrated the device. Evidence supports the hypothesis that these flashes occur when charged particles travel through the retina in the eye. Apollo 17 launches on December 7, 1972 Apollo 17 photo of the Earth as the spacecraft heads for the Moon Apollo 17 was the final crewed Saturn V launch, and the only one to occur at night. The launch was delayed by 2 hours and 40 minutes due to an automatic cutoff in the launch sequencer at the T-30 seconds mark in the countdown. The issue was quickly determined to be a minor technical error. The clock was reset and held at the T-22 minute mark while technicians worked around the malfunction in order to continue with the launch. This pause was the only launch delay in the Apollo program caused by this type of hardware failure. The countdown then resumed, and the liftoff occurred at 12.33 a.m. EST on December 7, 1972. The launch window, which had begun at the originally planned launch time of 9.53 p.m. on December 6, remained open until 1.31 a.m. There was another window with the same times beginning on the evening of December 7. Had both passed, Apollo 17 would have had to wait until January 4, 1973 to launch. Approximately 500,000 people were estimated to have observed the launch in the immediate vicinity of Kennedy Space Center, despite the early morning hour. The launch was visible as far away as 800 kilometers, and observers in Miami, Florida, reported a red streak crossing the northern sky. Among those in attendance at the program's final launch were astronauts Neil Armstrong and Dick Gordon, as well as centenarian Charlie Smith, who alleged he was 130 years old at the time of Apollo 17. In the few hours following the launch, Apollo 17 orbited the Earth twice while the crew spent time monitoring and checking the spacecraft to ensure its readiness to depart Earth orbit. At 3.46 a.m. EST, the SIVB third stage was reignited for the 351-second translunar injection burn to propel the spacecraft towards the Moon. Despite the launch delay, Apollo 17 would arrive in lunar orbit at the planned time, since ground controllers chose a faster trajectory for it than originally planned. 
The command and service module separated from the SIVB approximately half an hour following the SIVB translunar injection burn, after which Evans turned the spacecraft to face the LM, still attached to the SIVB. The CSM then docked with the LM and extracted it from the SIVB. Following the LM extraction, Mission Control Program the SIVB, the SIVB having achieved its purpose, to an impact trajectory with the Moon in order to trip the seismometers placed by prior Apollo crews. It struck the Moon just under 87 hours into the mission, triggering the seismometers from Apollo 12, 14, 15, and 16. Approximately 9 hours after launch, the crew concluded the mission's first day with a rest period. Mission Control and the crew decided to purposefully shorten the mission's second day, and first full day in space, in order to readjust. The crew's wake-up times for the subsequent days in preparation for an early morning wake-up time on the day of the lunar landing. Then scheduled for early afternoon. This adjustment was meant to compensate for the launch delays having had the effect of extending the duration of the mission's first day. Following the second rest period, and on the third day of the mission, the crew executed the first mid-course correction, a two-second burn of the CSM service propulsion engine to adjust the spacecraft's moon-bound trajectory. Following the burn, the crew opened the hatch separating the CSM and LM in order to assess the status of the LM systems and concluded that they were nominal. So that events would take place at the time indicated in the flight plan, the mission clocks were moved ahead by 2 hours and 40 minutes, the amount of the launch delay, at 65 hours 0 minutes 0 seconds into the mission. During the outbound trip, the crew took the photograph of Earth that is known as the Blue Marble from the spacecraft. There were few issues on the outbound journey, one of the latches holding the CSM and LM together was found to be unlatched. While Schmidt and Cernan were engaged in a second period of LM housekeeping beginning just before 60 hours into the mission, Evans worked on the balky latch. He was successful, and left it in the position it would need to be in for the CSM-LM docking that would occur on the return from the lunar surface. During the outward journey, the crew performed a heat flow and convection demonstration, as well as the Apollo light flash experiment. A few hours before entry into lunar orbit, the scientific instrument module door on the SM was jettisoned. At approximately 2.47 p.m. EST on December 10, the service propulsion system engine on the CSM ignited to slow down the CSM-LM stack into lunar orbit. Following orbit insertion and orbital stabilization, the crew began preparations for the landing at Taurus Littrow. The day of the landing began with a checkout of the lunar module systems, which revealed no issues preventing continuation of the mission. Cernan, Evans, and Schmidt each donned their spacesuits, and Cernan and Schmidt entered the LM in preparation for separating from the CSM and landing. The LM undocked from the CSM, and the two spacecraft orbited close together for about an hour and a half while the astronauts made visual inspections and conducted their final pre-landing checks. After finally separating from the CSM, the LM Challenger and its crew of two adjusted their orbit, such that its lowest point would pass about 10. 5 miles above the landing site, and began preparations for the descent to Taurus Litro. While Cernan and Schmidt prepared for landing, Command Module Pilot Ron Evans remained in orbit to take observations, perform experiments and await the return of his crewmates a few days later. Soon after completing their preparations for landing and just over two hours following the LMs and docking from the CSM, Cernan and Schmidt began. Their descent to the Taurus Litro Valley on the lunar surface with the ignition of the lunar module's descent propulsion system engine. Approximately 10 minutes after the ignition of the DPS engine and the initiation of the descent phase, the LM pitched over, giving the crew their first look at the landing site. During the descent phase and allowing Cernan to guide the spacecraft to a desirable landing target while Schmidt provided data from the flight computer essential for landing. The LM touched down on the lunar surface at 2.55 p.m. EST on December 11, just over 12 minutes after DPS ignition. Shortly thereafter, the two astronauts began reconfiguring the LM for their stay on the surface and began preparations for the first moonwalk of the mission, or EVA-1. Eugene Cernan on the lunar surface, December 13, 1972 During their stay on the lunar surface, Cernan and Schmidt performed three moonwalks. The astronauts deployed the LRV, the Apollo Lunar Surface Experiments Package and Seismic Explosive Charges. They drove the rover to nine planned geological survey stations to collect samples and make observations. Additionally, 12 short sampling stops were made at Schmidt's discretion while riding the rover, 
during which the astronauts rapidly collected lunar material without dismounting. During lunar surface operations, Commander Cernan always drove the rover, while Lunar Module Pilot Schmidt was a passenger who assisted with navigation. This division of responsibilities between the two crew positions was used consistently throughout Apollo's J missions. The first lunar excursion began four hours after landing, at 6.54 p.m. EST on December 11th. The first task was to offload the rover and other equipment from the LM. While working near the rover, Cernan caught his hammer under the right rear fender extension, accidentally breaking it off. A similar incident occurred on Apollo 16 as John Young maneuvered around the rover. Although this was not a mission-critical issue, the loss of the part caused Cernan and Schmidt to be covered with dust stirred up when the rover was in motion. The crew attempted a short-lived fix using duct tape at the beginning of the second EVA, attaching a paper map to the damaged fender. However, lunar dust stuck to the tape surface, preventing it from adhering properly. Following deployment and testing the maneuverability of the rover, the crew deployed the Alcept just west of the landing site. The Alcept deployment took longer than had been planned, with the drilling of core holes presenting some difficulty, meaning the geological portion of the first EVA would need to be shortened from a planned excursion to Emery Crater. Instead, following the deployment of the Alcept, Cernan and Schmidt departed for the first geological survey station, Steno Crater to the south of the landing site. The objective at Steno was to sample the subsurface material excavated by the impact that formed the crater. The astronauts gathered 14 kilograms of samples, took seven gravimeter measurements, and deployed two explosive packages. The latter were detonated remotely to test geophones placed by the astronauts, and also seismometers left during previous missions. The EVA ended after 7 hours and 12 minutes. Play media astronauts Cernan and Schmidt singing I was strolling on the moon one day to the words and tune of the 1884 song while strolling through the Park One Day Apollo 17 landing site, photographed in 2011 by Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Lunar Regolith collected during Apollo 17 on December 12. Awakened by Ride of the Valkyries, Cernan and Schmidt began their second lunar excursion. First, the rover's fender needed a better fix. Overnight, the flight controllers devised a procedure communicated by John Young, taping four chronopake maps together and clamping the replacement fender extension onto the fender. The astronauts carried out the new fix which did its job, lasting the remainder of the exploration. Cernan and Schmidt then departed for Station 2, Nansen Crater, at the foot of the South Massif. When they arrived, their range from the Challenger was 7. 6 kilometers. This remains the furthest distance any spacefarers have ever traveled away from the safety of a pressurizable spacecraft while on a planetary body, and also during an EVA of any type. The astronauts were at the extremity of their walk-back limit, a safety constraint meant to ensure that they could walk back to the LM if for whatever reason the rover failed. They began a return trip, traveling northeast. Stopping at Station 4, Shorty Crater, the astronauts discovered orange soil which proved to be very small beads of volcanic glass formed over three. Five billion years ago. The final stop before returning to the LM was Camelot Crater. Throughout the sojourn, the astronauts collected 34 kilograms of samples, took another seven gravimeter measurements, and deployed three more explosive packages. Concluding the EVA at 7 hours and 37 minutes, Cernan and Schmidt had completed the longest duration EVA in history to date. Traveling further away from a spacecraft and covering more ground on a planetary body during a single EVA than any other spacefarers. Once the LM was repressurized, Capcom Bob Parker was particularly impressed, saying, Absolutely outstanding. I can't say more than that. And I mean it from the bottom of my heart or the bottom of my soul or something. My conscience. The third moonwalk, the last of the Apollo program, began at 5.25 p.m. EST on December 13th. Cernan and Schmidt rode the rover northeast of the landing site, exploring the base of the North Massif and the sculptured hills. Stopping at Station 6, they examined a house-sized split boulder dubbed Tracy's Rock, after Cernan's daughter. The ninth and final planned station was conducted at Van Serg Crater. The crew collected 66 kilograms of lunar samples and took another 9 gravimeter measurements. Before concluding the moonwalk, the crew collected a breccia rock, dedicating it to the nations of Earth, 70 of which were represented by students touring the U.S. and present in Mission Control Center in Houston, Texas, at the time. Portions of this sample, known as the Friendship Rock, 
were subsequently distributed to the nations represented by the students. A plaque located on the LM, commemorating the achievements made during the Apollo program, was then unveiled. Before re-entering the LM for the final time, Gene Cernan remarked, I'm on the surface, and, as I take man's last step from the surface. Back home for some time to come, but we believe not too long into the future, I'd like to just, say, what I believe history will record. That America's challenge of today has forged man's destiny of tomorrow. And, as we leave the moon at Taurus Littrow, we leave as we came in, God willing, as we shall return, with peace and hope for all mankind. Godspeed the crew of Apollo 17. Cernan then followed Schmidt into the LM. The final lunar excursion had a duration of 7 hours and 15 minutes. Apollo 17 post splashdown recovery operations Eugene Cernan and Harrison Schmidt successfully lifted off from the lunar surface in the ascent stage of the LM on December 14, at 5.55 p.m. EST. After a successful rendezvous and docking with Ron Evans in the CSM in orbit. The crew transferred equipment and lunar samples between the LM and the CSM for return to Earth. Following this, the LM ascent stage was sealed off and jettisoned at 1.31 a.m. on December 15. The ascent stage was then deliberately crashed into the moon in a collision recorded by seismometers deployed on Apollo 17 and previous Apollo expeditions. During the return to Earth, Evans performed a 65-minute EVA to retrieve film cassettes from the service module Scientific Instrument Module Bay, with assistance from Schmidt who remained at the command module's hatch. At approximately 160,000 nautical miles from Earth, it was the third deep space EVA in history, performed at great distance from any planetary body. As of 2021, it remains one of only three such EVAs, all performed during Apollo's J missions under similar circumstances. It was the last EVA of the Apollo program. On December 19, the crew jettisoned the no longer needed SM, leaving only the CM for return to Earth. The Apollo 17 spacecraft re-entered Earth's atmosphere and landed safely in the Pacific Ocean at 2.25 p. m. 6. 4 kilometers from the recovery ship, USS Ticonderoga. Cernan, Evans, and Schmidt were then retrieved by a recovery helicopter and were safely aboard the recovery ship 52 minutes after landing. As the final Apollo mission concluded successfully, Mission control in Houston was filled with many former flight controllers and astronauts, who applauded as America returned to Earth. Apollo 17 Command Module America, on display at Space Center Houston The Command Module America is currently on display at Space Center Houston at the Lyndon B. Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. The ascent stage of Lunar Module Challenger impacted the Moon December 15, 1972, at 6.50 and 20 seconds. 8 UT at 19 degrees 58 and 30 degrees 30 E, Tisada Hashar. 96 degrees north 30. 50 degrees E, 19. 96. 30. Hamsat Sefer. The descent stage remains on the moon at the landing site, 20 degrees 11 27 and 30 degrees 46 18 E, Hishron. 19,080 degrees north 30. 77168 degrees E, 20. 19,080, 30. Sabhat Sabhat Wahid Sitat the Maniat. In 2009 and again in 2011, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter photographed the landing site from increasingly low orbits. The German space company PT Scientists is planning to land two lunar rovers near the landing site in 2020 or later. The crew of Apollo 17 carried a small Panamanian flag to the moon during the mission. In 1973, U.S. President Richard Nixon gave the flag and a moon rock to the government of Panama. Thanks for watching.